everybody. Welcome to the 16th episode of The Manor Podcast. I'm your co-host, Roger Bodie, joined as always with my best friend and other co-host, Michael Hamilton. Michael, what kind of Pokemon are you? How do you do the <laughs> things you do? Can you tell uh, me your secrets deep inside? Uh, this, is, this is too much. Uh, okay, we'll start with the first one. Yeah, yeah, what kind of Pokemon are you? Like what type or you yeah. mean something differently? Because yeah. kind, kind is not... Um... Probably not a flying type. You don't I fly am very well. Not a flying type. I could see being like ground or rock. I kind of like sitting around in my house, you know. Maybe a normal type. I guess humans are probably normal type if we had to be a Pokemon type. But I, I don't like traveling very much. So whatever doesn't move, <laughs> plant, grass type. So you're you're a rock plant. Maybe. What about you? What type of Pokemon would you be? I'd be poison because I'm so toxic, you know. <laughs> uh huh. Uh, okay (laughs) anyways so exciting news we have sleeves we're giving away uh if you want to be entered for our awesome sleeve giveaway be sure to leave a comment on our youtube video or email us at m.n.r.cast at gmail.com with your discord information or the best way to get a hold of you. I guess we'd have your email at that point too, to email you back. So one lucky listener will get a uh, hundred counts of custom dragon shield sleeves that we made that have the manor podcast logo on them. Michael and I haven't even had a chance to break out these bad boys ourselves. They're hot off the presses. So if you want a ch- chance to show off your awesome podcast taste at your local flesh and blood events or at your upcoming high level flesh and blood events be sure to enter in this amazing opportunity awesome i'm looking forward to using them myself at nationals this year yeah people love weeks. looking at them as they're watching you draft your millionth horrible icelander deck <laughs> i only had two horrible icelander decks at in leal yeah, that's that you only had two Pro Tour drafts in Leo, so <laughs> if you had a third Pro Tour draft, you probably would have a third horrible Icelander deck. No, at some point people are gonna not they're they're just how can you really have four Icelanders in the same pod three drafts in a row? What are the ask, odds of that happening? Ask my entire road to national season a hundred percent of the time. So but anyways, this is not a podcast discussion about horrible Icelander Luminate decks. This is going to be a discussion about Prism, right? Yeah, Prism, Luminaris, and the changes to the metagame now that Prism's gone. So I think we should start with what I think is the most important part of what led Prism to being, I guess, who she was or what having the, like the whole, her whole deck was basically built around Luminaris, right? Luminaris and the broken spectrum mechanic. (laughs) Yeah, so... Luminaris, uh, do you want to read what Luminaris does real quick? Luminaris allows you to attack with all of your auras. They become one-powered attacks. They have no cost to attack with. And whenever there's a yellow card in your pit zone, illusionist attacks you control have go again. So if there's a yellow card in your pit zone, you can attack with any illusionist auras you control for free for the whole turn with go again. And any of her illusionist attacks like heralds or even just as generic illusionist attacks naturally were given go again with her weapon. Yeah. So this kind of synergized with both of her card types. It synergized really well with the auras because all of her auras could suddenly attack for free. They cost zero resources, attack for one, and they got go again as long as there's a yellow card in your pitch zone, which is really powerful, especially when a lot of her auras were quite good, even without this ability to attack. And this just kind of made them, like you, you basically had to kill the auras or you would lose the game pretty quickly, right? Yeah, I don't know if the auras would be good if you couldn't attack with them. If they were just strictly the value on the face of the card. That's a really good question. I think Genesis would be the only one that would be good at that point. Maybe Parable of Humility, but I think the rest would kind of suck. Like, yeah. what would you care about a Merciful Retribution if it couldn't attack or anything like that? Well, her, her, her Spectral Shields is still be pinging you for one every turn and then every time you popped the herald you would take one and it would still but they couldn't attack the spectral shields couldn't attack so they would just sit there well they 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 just you can't not kill the spectral shields right you could not deal damage (laughs) 
<laughs> I guess that is actually kind of interesting. Everyone could potentially fatigue Prism at that point, right? Yeah, easy. Anyway, they could attack, so <laughs> I guess that's not super relevant. And <laughs> I'm going to say one more thing. Odorad looks kind of pretty bad if your auras can't attack. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it does. But uh, one thing that's really interesting about Luminaris leaving is I think it's the first weapon to actually leave that was reasonably powerful, I guess, as a result of this living legend change where they added weapons leaving along with the heroes. Because Chain took his weapon with him when he left, but his weapon wasn't seeing any play because Rosetta Thorn was just better. But, Galaxy Black, right? Yeah, Galaxy Black. But Prism leave, making Luminaris rotate, it basically means like if if or when we get another Light Illusionist. It's probably an if, but might also be a when, I don't know. Uh, they won't have Luminaris, so their gameplay will probably look reasonably different than how Prisms looked, right? I would assume so. So, even though I I would say that Prisms Hero Power, the paying two resources to remove a card from her soul to make a Spectral Shield, it wasn't a horrible Hero Power, but it wasn't, like, it wasn't super strong, and it wasn't, like, a Light Illusionist without that Hero Power would probably also play pretty similarly to how Prism played now if they had access to Luminaris. So Luminaris leaving means that the next Light Illusion, as we see, will probably at least feel reasonably different, I think. Well, what it did is it allowed her to consistently have a way to pitch a card without needing a card with a cost or an attack action in order to give the rest of her auras go again on the turn. So that was the most consistent use for it, where you'd have one card in your soul, four auras on the battlefield. You've blocked with your whole hand. All you have left now is this other aura, that four cost aura or yellow in your hand with not necessarily a way to cast it. So you would pitch it to Prism's hero ability in order to at least have that yellow card in the pitch zone because none of her equipment allowed her to just naturally pitch cards on her turn. And obviously if there's no cards that cost anything she can't just pitch a card for no reason so that was the primary use for it yeah that's fair that makes a lot of sense it was you block with three cards you pitch your one yellow to turn on all of your auras being able to attack with go again so you mentioned her other equipment i think outside of luminaris her equipment wasn't nearly as impressive as some of the other heroes we've seen living legend with the noticeable with the noticeable exception of phantasmal footsteps yeah those were quite good yeah, those were the first legendary we ever pulled. Remember that? Way back in the day, a year ago. We were so excited, we pulled a card that was worth $120 redues. This game was sick. It had cards that were worth infinite money. So, Phantasmal Footsteps say, the first time an illusionist attack action you control is destroyed each turn, you may pay one. If you do, gain one action point. So this comes up when your heralds get popped by Phantasm Poppers, which I guess... We can get into Phantasm more, but I'm going to finish reading Phantasmal Footsteps first. Um, and then it says, whenever you defend with Phantasmal Footsteps, you may pay one resource. If you do, its defense becomes one until end of turn. And if it defends a non-illusionist attack with six or more attack, destroy it when the combat chain closes. So these boots kind of did a couple things. Like like I was talking about at this its first ability where if your Herald got popped, you could spend a resource to get your action point back. That was pretty strong because as we see... Even with Dromai now, when sometimes when Dromai stuff gets popped, like whenever dragons get popped, it stops her whole turn. Where Prism having access to this ability to attack with the Herald, and if it gets popped, she can just pay one to get her action point back. That keeps her turn from being shut down when the go again doesn't resolve because the attack's destroyed. And then the second ability of paying one to make your boots defense become one until a turn, it kind of does a pretty good rampart of the Ram's head imperson- impersonation impression. In a lot of matchups where you block with the phantasmal footsteps and heroes that want to break the chain to play a non-attack action now are punished pretty heavily for doing so. Or dash. That was really where they shined a lot because you just always got to take one power off of every pistol attack the whole game. Mm -hmm. And Prism had a lot of instant speed abilities, including her hero power, but also many of her auras. Um, She could play Soul Shield also, which costed two, which worked perfectly off of a blue pitch with these shoes. And she also had the yellow auras that cost four that were pretty nice to give her something like these boots having, letting her convert one extra resource into one defense worked pretty well with a lot of her other cards. 
Yeah, that was one of the nice things about her is that she always had efficient ways to put spare resources into cards she could play at instant speed and on her opponent's turn or on her turn. So she was always able to maximize the pitch value of all of her cards. Mm -hmm. So moving on, the rest of her equipment suite isn't very impressive at all. For her chess piece, there were times when people played Vestige of Soul, the legendary light chess piece, but almost always now you saw Tunic in the chess slot, right? Yeah, I think that was more of a product of its time. I think Vestige of Soul was used primarily before the blue auras came out, and your deck was almost exclusively light cards because Vestures of Soul only boosts the pitch for light cards. And so if you're playing a bunch of just normal illusionist cards or generic cards, Vestures of Soul isn't boosting those cards for pitching. And most of the time she is trying to play her light illusionist cards, you know, her four cost auras or her heralds. So they're not a hundred percent of the cards you want to be pitching a lot of the time. And that's kind of why that card fell off in popularity, especially once the blue auras came out. Yeah, so the blue auras being as strong as they were, basically every prism list was playing all 12 that they could. Yeah. Meant that a lot of her resource cards were no longer light, so Vestige of Soul wasn't getting value anymore, or getting nearly as much value anymore. The best part about Vestige of Soul was pitching a blue light card in order to, because that blue would then pitch for four, and lo and behold, she has so many four cost auras, as well as Tome of Divinity that she was playing with the Best of the Soul build in order to draw two cards at instant speed. So pitching one card, drawing two cards is an extremely good effect once Vestige was actually turned on. And so once you lost Vestige, that's why you also saw cards like Tome of Divinity fall out of the deck. Makes sense. So moving on to her headpiece, she used to play Arcanite Skullcap, but I think most lists switched to Crown of Providence. Yeah, Crown of Providence is just almost strictly better than Arcanite Skullcap. Yeah, you lose out on some conditional Arcane Barrier, and you lose out on potentially one extra life worth of block. But the situational nature of Skullcap being that it's sometimes you can't, it's not turned on when you need to block some of the on hits that you want to block. And additionally, the filtering from Counter Providence being very powerful meant it was just usually the better choice. Especially in a deck like Prism, where since the four cost auras are instants, they don't block. So being able to filter some cards that don't block or an aqua card in your arsenal away was particularly valuable for a deck like Prism, just letting her be able to have more functional hands in general and access to more defensive resources when she needed them. Yeah. One other reason I think it was particularly good in Prism too is almost everyone boarded in their Command and Conquers against Prism because it has six power and can pop heralds. I'm not sure it was always correct, but I think it was pretty common to see people play Command and Conquer against Prism. So it's nice to have that as an extra out to just throw away your arsenal or get rid of your arsenal, get a new card when you aren't interested in blocking a Command and Conquer for six. But yeah, Crown of Providence was definitely a big upgrade for the deck as well and definitely contributed to it getting those last two Living Legend points in the Battle Harden in Lil. A Not call. Battle Harden, Calling in Lil. Yeah. And then her last piece of equipment was her glove slot. I think she didn't really have any gloves she was ever very happy about. Would you agree with that? I mean, most commonly she was playing Ironhide Gauntlets. That was like her best in slot for her gloves most of the time. <laughs> That's why yeah. we were actively excited to play into decks that were dealing arcane damage sometimes. Unfortunately, that most of the time meant rune blades, but at least you got null rune gloves for, you know, effective gloves in that, those matchups. Yeah, the piece of equipment you are giving up for null rune gloves is not a very uh, powerful High piece. Ass, yeah. Yeah. So that's her equipment. So let's kind of go on and talk about her game plan a little bit. So they kind of had two main axes of attack, both between the auras and the heralds. There was kind of like discussion between which you play. And I think the end result is that you generally have basically always include some auras and some heralds in your deck. And you're probably going to be playing some of them in basically every matchup. Right. But I think most of the time she was relying on her auras and the game to carry a lot of value. Yeah. So 
her ors have a mechanic that we've both kind of talked about how much we hate the spectra mechanic where they kind of sit on the battlefield and at any point you can use a card or an action to attack them with something that can attack and when you do that attack does not resolve it doesn't even ever become attacking it's when at, when the aura becomes a target of an attack you close the combat chain and you destroy the aura so this kind of led to some really interesting things the main interaction that mattered was on hit abilities or any abilities of the card attacking the aura didn't resolve and that includes go again because the combat chain just closes before go again has a chance to resolve yeah so that means if there are multiple auras with spectra on the battlefield it's especially hard to clean them up yeah it even led to people turning to some pretty weird cards to attack these auras the game doesn't have a lot of cards or effects that let you actually just gain action points for the most part it's just cards there's a lot of cards that say go again but those don't work so you have to rely on cards to actually say gain an action point the only two non-equipment cards i could think of that do this are lead the charge and blink (laughs) and yeah there's some brute cards obviously like scapskin uh leathers and some of the cards say specifically gain action points when you discard something that's six or graded because they don't have go again, but that's the other primary ways to generate action points that I can think of. That makes sense. So it ended up leading to a metagame. Oh, time you... skippers. Oh yeah. Time skippers. You're, cl- you're everybody's favorite boots in old time. <laughs> yeah. But it ended up leading to this lack of ways to gain action points I ended up leading to prisms or is just being really frustrating to play against, I would say. And not, not really something that it seemed like there was a lot of options that you could put in your deck to really like counteract the auras themselves outside of just playing lead the charge, which almost every deck in the format ended up <laughs> that that was trying to beat prism ended up playing some number of lead the charge, right? Yeah. You can a cyborg staple along with your six power attacks. Yeah. So the other direction that Prism pulled people was these heralds, and there were some non-heralds, but basically these big illusionist attacks that had Phantasm, which says if it's blocked by an attack with six or more power, then destroy the attack and close the combat chain. So it just dies if you block with a six power attack, which is really weird, I think. Yeah. Importantly, though, there was a card in Everfest, Miraging Metamorph. That's an illusionist attack that doesn't have Phantasm on it. It's weird. You would think that a 1 for 7 would have Phantasm on it, but it's actually not on the card. I've never seen that card ever be popped in my life, so I don't think it has Phantasm. I've popped several Miraging Metamorphs in my days. I No wonder why you lost to Prism so much. Yep, yep. I think there was one game. It was one of our first games after that card came out. I think it might have been you, I'm pretty sure, where it was turn 0, and you attacked me with a Miraging Metamorph. And I look at my hand, and every card in my hand that I can block with will pop it. So I'm either going to pop it, or I'm going to take 7 damage. And I decided to pop it, and in response to the Phantasm trigger, you just flashed in one of the 4 cost auras, and then you made a copy of it, and then the game was over. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good game, yep. <laughs> but aside from that one time, I don't think it ever had Phantasm ever again after that. And then there have been times where... The only auras in play are spectral shields, and I've popped it in those spots as well when they don't have enough resources to flash in a yellow aura in response. Yeah, but even then you're still pretty happy with it because it's still just a 1 for 7 that ate a big powered attack. I kind of alluded to this a little bit on previous episodes where we talked about Prism, where it was a common play pattern once you became well-versed in Prism to just throw out Herald sometimes to bait your opponent to pop them a lot of players sometimes will just uh, reflexively say oh this dies to a six powered attack i have a six powered attack i should do the thing and if their hand no longer has that six powered attack and that means that there's less damage that they're going to be able to present to you because they just lost an attack that has six or more power and for prism you're basically then in the if you think about it in the reverse at that point your herald just blocked for six or more damage at that point just on your turn and that was kind of interesting lines and play patterns you could take to use your offensive cards defensively in a weird sense like that so 
I guess I have a question for you. I know we both don't like Spectre very much. How do you feel about Phantasm as a mechanic? Just the ability that they get popped if they're blocked with a six power attack. The more I play with Phantasm, the more I think it's an interesting ability. I don't necessarily think it's interesting on dragons at the moment. I don't think dragons are particularly well balanced around their Phantasm at the moment. I think some of them are just way too good and some of them are just way too mopey, but maybe that's just an awkward design philosophy around any permanent on the battlefield. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but all the Phantasm attacks themselves, I think, are really interesting in that there's a tension between, like I said, do you dedicate one of your six powered attacks to blocking it, extra resources to blocking it because you don't want to pop it. There's just a lot of push and pull that creates interesting game state decisions for both you and your opponent. If you just do you even want to attack with your phantasm attack right now if you don't have the resources to get your action point with phantasmal footsteps or if you don't have uh anything else that or if you have a different line or different card you can play that's not as risky maybe you'll want to play that instead so i think there's a lot of push and pull in the phantasm mechanic on attack action cards yeah as far as what the answer is for you know either allies or auras on the battlefield and how to balance those i don't know that's not my job to figure out (laughs) (laughs) i don't know if there is an answer it's it seems like at least the way they structured auras they are extremely good in some matchups and fine in most matchups and only i think they're only kind of I would say only really bad against the ninjas right now, where Fi gets to end his combat chain with these Phoenix Flames that kill him, or at the cost of an attack that was going to do one damage. So, Yeah, or Katsu just throwing one last Kadachi swing at the end of the chain for one resource. Yeah, so the ninjas are pretty punishing to the auras, but outside of that, I don't think any other heroes really have very efficient answers to the aura spam. Yeah, because even against Rune Blades, every time they swung Rosetta Thorn at an aura instead of your face that's just four life you gained on that turn cycle which is pretty nice yeah rosetta thorn like you can say a lot about how powerful it is and i think it's definitely one of the best if not the best weapon currently in the game but they did have to jump through some hoops to get that four damage for one resource they have to play their non-attacks they have to play their attacks they have to play ways to give their attacks go again or their attacks have to naturally have go again and it's definitely not free for them to basically have this Rosetta Thorn in their deck. And I think without Rosetta Thorn, none of the Rune Blades would be in a very good spot at all. So I think that the fact that they're able to kill it for one resource, that doesn't mean it's like not a good deal for you when they're li- losing four damage to kill the aura, basically. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then there's the one aura that nobody can ignore just demands an answer right away which is arc light sentinel and i think this is a card that as my skill level grew with prism my appreciation for this card grew more and more and i think this is the card i'm going to miss the most out of any card out of prism arc light sentinel just led to really interesting ways to mess up your opponent's turn cycles and game plans and there were just really interesting ways to get even more value for and get extra rewards for disrupting your opponent whether that be having a haze bending on the battlefield or uh merciful retribution so then you dealt the port of arcane damage and went to soul or genesis on the battlefield and so you got an extra turn cycle of having your genesis around there were just so many good ores that it could just protect and get extra value out of on top of which just allowing you to even after if your opponent has a mopey turn cycle where they're just attacking you for like you know five or six damage sometimes you'll just play an arc light sentinel at the the end of their turn and then do something on your turn pitch a card attack with it and then draw back up and then you're just clear to then just set up more of your four cost instant speed auras or attack with a bunch of heralds or just keep your whole hand knowing that you're not going to be pressured at all. <laughs> I, I agree. I think Arclight Sentinel also might have been the most controversial card in Prism because when you, basically if you're against the Prism and you say no blocks, you keep your five card hand and a lot of the time, a lot of heroes would do something before they play their first attack action because that's the natural play pattern of the hero and then Prism could respond with Arclight Sentinel and you just feel so punished for maybe not blocking a herald or 
not or just keeping a five card hand and even just like having no ways to efficiently use it after she plays that arc light sentinel yeah it's, importantly some heroes just can't do anything about it for example Pri- briar when her embodiments of earth disappear at the beginning of her turn you can play an arc light sentinel in response to that embodiment going away and there's nothing briar can do about it there's just uh, that priority window that exists in order to shut whatever her options down and that led to mm-hmm. some people conveniently forgetting to make some embodiment of earths against me that i probably should have called a judge for in hindsight but hey eh, what are you gonna do <laughs> yeah the other thing that was really i guess so Prism started with only access to the 15 yellow ores, where she had Arclight Sentinel, Merciful Retribution, Parable of Humility, Ode to Wrath, and Genesis. And at that point, there was... Even Heroes like Oldheim had some game into Prism where it felt like she was almost never playing two ores a turn until the super late game where she had pitch stacked maybe her tomes into ores with using Vestige or something like that. But once she got access to these extra blue ores that she could just play at the cost of zero resources and her action point... I think that's what Prism really became a powerhouse and kind of bullied some heroes to the point where their matchups felt, I would say, almost unwinnable for those heroes. And when the Blue Auras first got spoiled at Everfest, I remember looking at them, I'm like, wow, Haze Bending seems broken and these other ones seem not that good. And then just seeing them get played and how quickly they became, it became clear that it was correct to just put all 12 in your deck was really interesting to me. Yeah, even the Mopiest one, Pierce Reality, the one that gives plus two to your illusionist uh, attack action cards, the first one you play every turn, you would think that card's not very impactful on a game until you attack for your first Wartoon Herald for nine. So one for <laughs> nine, go again, is a pretty good rate on a card. <laughs> yeah, it is. And then also them having, even if they aren't, even if they had no text box, the fact that With Luminaris, you get to attack with them for one every turn as long as they're there, as long as you're pitching that yellow aura. And them being free just meant it was so efficient to get them down. Just the cost of one card and one action point for something that your opponent had to spend an action point and either cards or resources to swing a weapon at just was really powerful. Yeah, absolutely. And on top of that, they're also blue, so they just pitch for three if you want to pitch them. You could, even late game, they only block for two, but you could still use them to like maybe block with shoes and make a spectral shield with prism's ability or cast your soul shield and block with shoes or yeah. several other things. They were just they were are really strong. iron hide gauntlets. Woo, we're doing <laughs> yeah. it. Oh yes. Iron hide gauntlets. <laughs> but really a lot of the time or the most efficient way to use them were to activate tunic, pitch a blue, play a four cost aura. So that was mm-hmm. probably the best way you can use them when you're pitching them. Yeah, that makes sense. Or pitching two for Arclight Sentinel. Hell yeah, buddy. So, I guess, touching on, or moving on, Prism had some pretty polarized matchups. I would say that it's like roughly a third of the field that I'd say she basically auto won against with Oldheim, Bravo, Icelander, Kano, Dorinthia. There's probably some other heroes that had no chance into Prism, but those are just the ones that immediately jumped to mind. The Guardians, the Wizards, and I guess the Warriors. Bolton probably belongs on there as well. Interestingly, I think she had a really good matchup into the Brutes as well. You would think with their access to like scab skin leathers, they'd have ways to do it. But in my experience, a lot of the time, their hands just were too clunky in order to effectively actually get two attacks off, even with the action points a lot of the time, in order to clean up multiple auras. And if they were doing that, then they're spending so many resources cleaning up the auras that they're not really executing their big attack you brute game plan at that point. Yeah, that makes sense. And then eventually, if they're rolling scab skins every turn to try to clean up two auras, at some point they're going to roll one. one. Yeah. <laughs> you just play more auras and then their game's just way over. Yeah, you have 27 auras in your deck. It's pretty rough for them to get through 27 auras without hitting a couple ones on their scab skin leathers. Yeah. And the turns, they just roll one also. It's, they're, they're not making a lot of progress if they roll one. Maybe they can <laughs> attack you with go again. Or, sorry, one action point, not a one result on the die. So a two or a three, they get, their oh, one you're saying, yeah, they're not, yeah, they're not making a lot of progress. That's one way to put that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. When they roll one, they're just skipping their turn basically. But even when they roll a two or a three to get one action point back, that still kind of frequently leave them in a rough spot because it's difficult for the brutes to get go again or get extra action points outside of scab skin leathers. So 
it's hard for them to attack Prism and then end their turn with attacking the aura with with a weapon or something. We need a Lightning Brute. Lightning Brute would be kind of sick because then you can roll Scabskin Leathers and if you roll a 1, you can play Blink and then attack with whatever. It's not amazing, but it's a really good hedge for rolling a 1 on Scabskin. So Lightning Brute, please. <laughs> that would be pretty cool. There's a lot of cool room for more class and talent combinations. Yeah, I doubt we'll ever see a Light Illusionist again, if I'm being honest. I'd, or maybe in Blitz. Uh, I would be surprised if LSS just quietly retires all of the four-cost yellow Spectra auras and never makes another card with Spectra again now. Like, we've had we've had enough of these. It's just, it's just a rules nightmare. It's not fun. They require very specific cards in your opponent's deck in order to answer and clean them up. People just don't like Spectra. And you know what? As much as I love Prism, I can play her on Living Legend. She's probably at an appropriate power level for that. It'll be veteran players playing Living Legend in the future. We can just keep Spectra and those amazing core cost auras there and call it a day. That sounds good to me. Uh I will not miss them in my class constructed as I play my guardians that can never beat them. Yeah, so I guess the guardians are the biggest winner of her rotating out now, right? Guardians and wizards? They can yeah, come guardians, out to play? Guardians and wizards for sure. Though, I think Oldheim didn't do too bad at the Pro Tour. There were four in the top 16 despite none of them making top eight. There were a lot of Oldheims losing to Prism in the last round of the Swiss. Yeah, I... Yeah, we've discussed this. I thought there would be a good amount of old times at the Pro Tour, and there were a good amount of old times at the Pro Tour. I just didn't get to play against them. It's like one tear slows slowly down my cheek. Yeah. So I guess jumping back to the Pro Tour weekend, Prism did really well at that, the, both the calling and the Pro Tour, despite Briar being everywhere. So she was like, kind of it was pretty commonly stated that she had a bad matchup into the aggro decks briar viscera and phi were all supposed to be pretty good against prism so phi was very good into prism in particular just the amount of damage that phi presents on any one given turn cycle really punishes hands that don't block and as we were saying earlier phi's ability to just kind of pop one aura a turn for free at the end of any given combat chain made it so that she couldn't set up auras and her Herald plan wasn't usually capable of presenting enough damage back to effectively race Fi, and I thought that was Prism's worst matchup by far. I will say on the weekend, playing Briar five times, I did beat Briar twice, and my three other games were insanely close, where both my opponent and I were down to like two or three life at the end, and I really felt like I could have made some different plays at different points in order to win those games. And I think that's why you saw, I guess, admittedly, the better players on Prism doing well on the weekend. Sure, maybe they didn't play Briar as many times as I did. I'd be hard to play her more than I did. But <laughs> uh, I think in the end, that matchup, if both players are very skilled, I think it's kind of a coin flip. And there's some variance as to when your Arclight Sentinels line up against the Channel Mount Heroic turns. Obviously, if your opponent plays a Channel Mount Heroic and at the end of that turn you get to flash in uh, an Arclight Sentinel and they can't pitch two Earth cards in the next turn cycle to keep it around, that's an insane amount of value you just stole off of Briar's best card in the deck and the reason why you're playing Briar. So that interaction was really, really, really good and the primary reason why Prism had a fighting chance in that matchup. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because Briar spends two full cards to set up the Channel Mount Heroic on the previous turn. And then if you just can follow that up with an Arclight Sentinel on the, the main turn, the turn where they should have a four or five card hand with the Channel Mount Heroic in play, and all they get to do is pop the Arclight Sentinel and lose their channel, that's a pretty big blowout. Yeah, and then conversely, when you would draw a bunch of four cost auras on their Channel Mount Heroic and you would just take 15, 20 damage because your hand didn't block... That was also not a good situation, so um, that's why the matchup, I said there was a decent amount of variance, but there's still a lot of play into it. There's still a lot of important decisions to be made on both players' side on evaluating resources, life, tempo, and I think in a different world, I do win maybe one more time. I be, I maybe I beat my second Briar, and then I don't play Briar anymore against the weekend. My matchups just shake out differently, but... Mm -hmm. 
I was comfortable playing that matchup, I, I think, three times at like a 50-50 or like a between a 30 to 50% win rate I was expecting, depending on play, deck builds, all that stuff. I just didn't expect to play a game, nothing but Briar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So it was a bad matchup for Prism, but it definitely wasn't... As bad as Prism, yeah. as Oldheim was into Prism. Yeah, or any of those decks that I listed earlier, that Prism just kind of like... Their their don't game plans die. don't function against Prism basically. Right. They don't. They Prism has such a powerful game plan with between our auras and our heralds, and if they don't interact with it, they can't pop any of the heralds. They can't kill any of the auras. Or they can't do e- either. It was usually one being vulnerable to one or both of those things that kept heroes from being able to really compete with Prism, and a lot of heroes just couldn't beat one or both of her plans and. Those matches were horrible. So Prism versus Briar, not anywhere near that bad. Right. Prism. Viscerai was probably a worse matchup for Prism overall, just because the split damage between the arcane and physical is pretty hard for her to deal with a lot of the time. And Viscerai just has more efficient individual turn cycles across the turn of the game instead of maximized value high point turn si- turn cycles. And that led to Prism losing out on more turn cycles than she won, which just made the matchup worse for her in general, in my opinion. Yeah. I also saw, I think Pablo's list had six copies of Lead the Charge. So it was pretty, pretty ready to kill some auras in right. the Prism matchup. Because at that point, you're not losing anything between Lead the Charge and Mauvern Skies. And play and leading leading your turn with a Mauvern Skies, you can still get blown out by an Arclight Sentinel. Leading your turn with a Lead the Charge... That Arc Light Sentinel's not getting played. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Makes sense. And but, oh, go ahead. One thing Viscerai also had going for him, against even if one of his bigger turns got beat out by an Arc Light Sentinel, he could still, I think we might have talked about this on the podcast already, but he could still make several rune chants that turn, and it wasn't really a wash as yeah, much as... Yeah, you could just could float your five prior. damage and move on with your life or whatever. Yeah, And that's what kind of leads me to think that Dromai, in every sense of the word, is a fixed illusionist. I think LSS really learned their lessons from uh, Prism when designing their next illusionist. Once again, we see that dragons don't have Spectra, they just have Phantasm, so they're easier to deal with, and on hits will actually, and go again, will actually resolve after attacking a dragon. Well, some on hits. If the on hit specifically says when this hits a hero, it won't hit, obviously. And that really matters for decks like Oldheim in the Guardians and some other on hit effects, but like Command and Conquer. But more often than not, a lot of on hits just need to quote hit on hit, not hit a hero. And her resource management with the ashes also dictates whether or not she could even play the dragon. She can't just play them for free. She needs to have this other outside resource that she has to manage in order to set up these high value uh, board pieces. But, and her matchups are more well rounded, I would say. So, even Dromai into Oldheim, it's definitely Dromai favored, but there's a lot more game to that matchup than there was Prism into Oldheim. And even Dromai's bad matchups, you know, at the Rune Blades, there's more game in those matchups as well from the Dromai side. So I think she's just a much healthier hero to exist in the meta overall. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And the way you tech for Dromai isn't as weird as playing copies of Lead the Charge specifically. That's one <laughs> card that's good against her. You can play anything that gives like go again. You can play more poppers. There's a lot of ways to attack Dromai that kind of feel more natural that you could include them in a deck. If I put like Enlightened Strike or Zealous Belting in my Guardian deck to make sure I can kill two dragons in one turn, that's those cards yeah. aren't embarrassing cards. They're not cards that have no function outside of killing auras like Lead the Charge did. Yeah, it turns out attacks with Go again are a lot more ubiquitous than attacks that generate or ways to generate action points. <laughs> yeah. So Aside from the meta shakeup from these polarized matchups on Prism, what do you think the future of Flesh and Blood opens up now? Do you think more mid-range decks are viable, or do you still think, or no, because now there's no real check for keeping these powerful guardians at bay now? Is it just an old Heim world and we're just living in it now? (laughs) So I think that 
mid range definitely has a lot of room to rise up now. I think actually Oldheim really preys on the aggro decks, but isn't specifically good into a lot of mid range decks that can do a reasonable mixture of defending and setting up solid board states and overwhelming having like very big turns that they set up for like could you name a deck that's a mid-range deck that old time is bad into uh trying to think what mid-range decks are out there bravo i think is not but you just crush bravo old time's good into bravo i'm like um but so like mid-range in my mind would be like a dorinthia or a bolton like warriors are mid-rangey where they're not super aggressive and they're not super controlling and old time crushes warriors and there's strategies like Viserai where he's kind of playing a mid-range game a lot of the time where he's just, like I said, going for really efficient individual turn cycles and old times very good into Viserai. And I think really, like if we look at the triangle of how Flesh and Blood you know, thinks about archetypes where it's the aggro decks, control decks, and the setup decks, we really mm-hmm. only have one setup deck that's really powerful into old time and that's dromai now well, I think, icelander too so you still think icelander is favored in old time i think so uh it is less extreme than i thought it was because i think heart of ice helps a lot but i would still say that icelander is favored in old time that's interesting okay um, especially if the old times are going heavier on the defensive stuff they need to be very aggressive to be able to beat the setup decks yeah and then the last setup deck would just be dash but i i still don't think dash is super favored into oldheim unless she hits all of her items really early in like the first like half of the deck yeah there's specific things oldheim can do to kind of tech to improve the dash matchup but if the old is not really like devoting sideboard slots to it i think it is slightly at least slightly favored for dash that's fair, but still, none of those decks are as like good at dunking on Oldheim as Prism was. And so, if Oldheim's bad matchups got a lot better, and his good matchups are still insanely good, it just feels like we're in Oldheim territory now. And I think we saw that with Oldheim winning the first battle harden post Prism. Congrats, Ryan! If only you could yeah. win on our team sealed as much as you did in battle harden. <laughs> good job, Ryan. I'm proud of you. <laughs> Oh, I also wanted to mention that when we kind of did our metagame expectations at the start of the season, we had Prism at the top, and I don't think she really disappointed us. She was an S-tier hero that potentially one of the best, if not the best, hero to play, and she was only held back by her slightly losing matchups into the aggro decks and just crushed the rest of the field, right? Yeah, it's basically almost exactly how we predicted, where Prism was the probably the best deck in the format. And then we've expected all the aggro decks to be a tier because they're very good into prism and it prisms keeping the guardians and all the other, and like so many decks at bay, it just basically becomes this prism versus aggro deck meta. And then the B tier was your, at the end of a tier or however we had it was an old high movie to all the aggro decks. And then at the end of the day at the pro tour, you played the, old time deck to beat up all the aggro decks and then i played the s tier prism deck and then just got beat up by all the a tier decks mm-hmm. and then <laughs> the only thing i regret from our list is that i felt lexi in a tier <laughs> poor lexi yeah, loose. just hasn't been showing putting up the results that i expected her to yeah i don't know lexi if only lexi they, they should have just made it so Briar can play ball lightning or something. I don't know. She really needs that card. Yeah. She also needs Command and Conquer to be less less ubiquitous in the format, too. Mm, yeah. That card is pretty good against Lexi, huh? If if every opponent had zero Command and Conquers in their deck, I would have no reservations about playing Lexi in a tournament. But like you're just having a good time playing your Lexi card. You set up your big double arsenal turn and they go Command and Conquer. It, you're like, well, I lose. <laughs> especially now if all the if so many Command and Conquer decks are also playing Pummel. And then you 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 just you, you even protect your arsenal. You block it with your two arrows from hand. Like, it's okay. We protected this three of a kind we have in our arsenal. And then they Pummel it. And then you discard your last card and you lose <laughs> all your arsenal. And you just walk away from the team. They, they take the counter off their tunic and play their Pummel. <laughs> and then you're like, well, what a rough day to be Lexi. <laughs> If only this card didn't exist, my hero could exist. 
Mm-hmm. If only my trap cards could work. <laughs> you can't. <dude. laughs> you can't play defense reactions against Commander Conquer. <laughs> Uh, that's the joke. Someday we'll have a Lexi Living Legend episode. It might be like five years down the line, but we'll get there someday. No, man, they're <laughs> going to print broken elemental arrows in Dynasty. That's the dynasty of... That's how the Emperor got to where he, he was. He had broken, awesome royal arrows. and She'll just have to be wear the royal headpiece instead of New Horizon, but she'll have royal arrows. If they just give her like some blocking gloves and some blocking shoes, then maybe that'll do it for her. She needs like some powerful powerful abilities on her equipment because new horizons is very good but the rest of her equipment suite is yeah she has new horizons final spring voltaire. tunic and voltaire two, two makes bad because her games go like three turns i'll well, play heart and cross strap all of her arrows cost one <laughs> but you need to load them right heart and cross strap makes your next attack cost two less uh play deep blue you can play blossom of springs or whatever sacrifice no. to get one resource deep blue just gives you three resources right yeah. At the cost of a card. Yeah, but you have a million cards. You have two cards in your arsenal. <laughs> you three of a kind, deep blue, good clean living. Boop. Easy. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we only got a little off topic talking about our girl Lexi. Any closing thoughts on Prism and Luminaris leaving before we wrap it up? I'm looking forward to beating up all the chains and Starvos and Living Legend soon. Yeah, By soon, I mean like in a year or two. Yeah, Briar will be there pretty soon, and then we'll have four heroes, so it's it's almost there. It's almost a playable format. Yeah, and what's nice is that Briar will be playable in Living Legend. There's no reason why you'd ever look at it. At like, well, I can either play Chain or Starvo or Bri- Like, Why would you ever pick Briar out of those three decks? Well, you, get, you get Ball Lightning Plunder Run, right? It's pretty close to... Why would you not Briar? play a Ball li- or why would you not play a Plunder Running Plunder Run Chain? That just seems... He's just a better room blade. Uh... I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. I'm not a Runeblade expert by any means, and I know people love their Briar, so... That's why we didn't see Briar do anything until Chain Rotated, and then people are like, oh, well, well I guess we'll Briar, play the next best Runeblade. And then... Briar crushed the format before Chain was rotated. Then she oh, got, I guess pre nerf She got I guess nerfed they and several cards banned. Do you, maybe, maybe if they unnerf Briar in Living Legend, that'd be kind of interesting. That would be so confusing, though. You play Blitz, your Briar does one thing. You play Living Legend, she does another thing. I wonder if her and Blitz, just un- what, what does it matter if she makes more embodiments of Earth and Blitz? Nobody plays that format. It's not in Worlds. <laughs> Ooh, I have no idea what I'm playing in Blitz at Worlds. Could be anything. Kano. Okay, could be almost anything. Azalea. Yep, that's the one. Azalea. Dread, Dreadbore. Opponents can't play defense reactions from their hand. Got him. Okay, honestly, if I play Azalea at the at Worlds in Blitz, Dreadboar will probably be one of my eleven equipment sideboard. <laughs> there just aren't that many good options for Rangers. So. Yeah. That if There's, I know someone's on hardcore fatigue old time or something, you can Dreadboar them. Boom. I look forward to seeing it. The odds of me playing Azalea are pretty close to zero. There aren't even new cards before then, right? I like how it's not zero. It's pretty close to zero. Like. <laughs> there's a world actually where you do play well, azalea in world i mean if someone offers me enough money i'll do i'll do a lot of things you <laughs> you can't, michael hamilton are you saying you'd accept bribes to throw matches at the pro tour you I would w- never no, do something no, it like would that. not be to throw matches if, <laughs> be to if you're playing azalea, azalea you're throwing matches I don't know that's, what you're not, about. that's not throwing matches that's throwing the tournaments there's a difference <laughs> throwing matches is like when you're like at the match, and then you make a conscious decision based on something in the match to throw yeah, the match. You, like, you, you, the conscious decision to or, say, I'm playing Azalea, what's your hero at the start of the round? <laughs> you, you don't have a choice at the start of the round. You, it's all choices you make before the tournament. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. When you show up to player registration and you're like, this is my blitz list and it says Azalea, whatever. Oh, you yeah. don't, it doesn't even get her some name thing. because People blitz. know Just Michael Azalea. Hamilton had been wired some unknown amount of money into a Cayman Island account. <laughs> all right probably not playing azalea at worlds <laughs> how about you any closing thoughts from you michael hamilton goodbye prism i'm glad to see her leave <laughs> yeah you would be you, even though you beat her at the calling can't be that bad got quite lucky things went well for me <laughs> mm-hmm. okay everybody 
Thank you very much for listening to this week's episode. Remember to leave a comment if you want to leave those sleeves or send us an email at m.n.r.cast at gmail.com. And hopefully you can be sleeving up your next sweet deck in some Manor Podcast sleeves. And then when you're playing with those sleeves, always remember, mind your manners. Thanks for listening, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>